that funny drop down in the top left of, of chat GPT. There must be something, there's, there's, there, there must be some internal joke about, well, how should we order it? What should we call the next one? We have this philosophy of iterative deployment, which is AI is going to change all of us. It's going to change the world. It's going to change society. And we believe that the best way to do that is to kind of co-evolve together, is to get these models out there and put them in people's hands, help them understand. And also, you know, they help us discover the capabilities of the models and the weaknesses and other things. And so we, we sort of learn together and can iterate really quickly and improve. So that's part of it. The other part of it is we're building a lot of new capabilities as we go. And if we took the time to only, you know, we, we just had like one model and we just had to build everything into one model, we'd end up moving a lot more slowly. And, you know, things would be simpler for sure, but we'd end up moving a lot more slowly because sometimes it's easier to build a new model with a certain set of capabilities that's great at certain things, not as good at other things. And so together you have sort of a, a collection of models that, that can do lots of things. Each individual model has its strengths and weaknesses. And so basically we've just, we've optimized for going faster and getting more capabilities in people's hands at the expense of a bit of confusion. And then over time, as we sort of gain more control over some of the new functionality, we understand it better. We build it back into the core model. So you have models like GPT-4 that can do a lot of things well. Um, and, you know, that this is what we're trying to do with our forthcoming GPT-5 is take a lot of the things that we've learned and build more of the capabilities into a single model so that it's easier for people to reason about. It's like, what model do I use? Just use GPT-5. And, you know, in a perfect world, it knows how hard the question you ask it is. And so it knows whether it should give you an answer like this or whether it should think for a while. And, you know, that, that's what we're shooting for. In a way, that's lifting the cognitive load that is currently on, on the user because I will sit there and I'll think, do I have time? Is that a complicated question? Does it need to go to the reasoning model 03? Deep research is an interesting example where for a while, there were a handful of researchers thinking about the, it was like, okay, we could probably make the model able to do this like iterative kind of research where, you know, with deep research, you give the model a arbitrarily complex query to go research something that would probably take you a week and it will go off and it'll go off and do like a hundred searches, but not all at once. It'll do, it'll do three or four or five and then it'll reason about the results that it gets back, try and understand how they pertain to what you asked and what gaps are still there. And then it'll go off and do some more searches and maybe think again. Maybe it'll write some code for a little while as it thinks and then go do some more, you know. And so it's this sort of iterative, I mean, it's what you would do if you were, if someone made you write a very complex research report. You wouldn't, you go do some research. Sorry, Kevin, I don't do that anymore. I just go to deep research and I actually can't remember how to do it on my own. But yes, I understand, right? You have to, you, you sort of inch your way across and you, you figure out exploration strategies and go down dead ends and come back. Yeah. And so to your question, like that, that was something that some folks were like, okay, this is coming together, but it's not clear exactly when it will come together. Like we, we can. And so there was a, there was a small team of researchers that just believed in this and, and were working to make this real. And, you know, for a while it wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. And then there was, you know, some advances and all of a sudden you're like, okay, this is getting good enough. And somewhere, somewhere in that time frame, we put also a product and engineering team working, working on it with them. And then you have the thing that I think really is the magical part of OpenAI. When you get a research team and a product and engineering team just, you know, in the same room, all bringing their unique skills to bear and you're, you, you understand the problem you're trying to solve. And so you're bringing back use cases creating evals and benchmarks for how you measure whether you're successful against those use cases. The research teams are taking that and using that to improve the model itself. And you get this tight loop of the model improving towards a particular product. And uh, it, it's, you know, I, I think our best products are the ones that we build that way. And deep research is a good example. How far out are model capabilities being delivered? Are there things that are being worked on today that might not make their way into models until mid-2026? Yeah, it's a good question. It's one of the most interesting things about working here is you kind of have a sense of what's coming. 
And, you know, I'm not in the research team, so I'm getting this, you know, a, a, as I collaborate and work with the researchers, I would say like, you know, on the product side, we have a decent sense of what's coming in the next, say, three months, maybe a hazy sense over the next six months. And beyond that, it's, it's harder to say. You know, you, you have a certain set of capabilities, you know, where like, you know a bit, but you see things coming through the haze a little bit. And sometimes, sometimes capabilities are, you know, it's research, right? So it's not like you just, you, you have the formula and you just turn the crank. We're uncovering new things and it's unpredictable. So sometimes things take longer than expected. Other times you see these capabilities that you didn't expect at all that are kind of emergent and all of a sudden something just works. That's quite, I mean, that's a novel way of, of thinking about product development. I mean, if I think about the history of, of, of product development, quite often it was, you know, before the 90s, before the consumer internet it was run by engineers and they'd say, we've got a new chip that can do this. And you then try to figure out some software that can do useful things on that chip. And I think the big breakthrough of the consumer internet was to put product managers at the heart of product development. And you, you did, you know, we talked about lean and iteration and being very data-driven and user-centric. And now we're getting, you're getting to this new model, which I would characterize as not at all a return to the pre-internet product en engineering led, but, but something that is quite, quite novel because the researchers discover something that's a little bit a new capability. And then you have to have a very rapid discussion about how can that capability be productized. And then this word you used, eval, which I guess it means how can it be measured to see whether it's actually doing its, its trick. So, so is it really a new discipline that is evolving at this point? I think it's a completely different way of building products. It's certainly different than anything I've ever, I've ever done in my career. And, you know, within research, there's kind of a, there's a spectrum, right? There are, there are parts of our research team that are, that are just like deep research. It's almost academic in nature because they're trying to just like, they're, they're looking for new breakthroughs. They're trying to, to find things that nobody has ever, you know, figure out things that nobody's ever figured out before. And those kinds of things, you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be product driven at all because you, you just, you want to give a lot of room for exploration and fundamental breakthroughs. And then there's kind of the other end of research that it's more in the, on the post-training side where you really are trying to teach the models to do specific things very well. And that those teams tend to be much more like, you know, partnered with product and engineering teams with a common goal. And then it's kind of a spectrum in between. I think the right way for us to be is not, we certainly don't want to be entirely product led. That's not, that's not the magic of this place. It's not maybe entirely research led either, because it's good to know, you know, feedback about what problems you can solve for people and how we can make the biggest impact in the world. It's really sort of a combination of both with research really at the core though. And I, I like, I've loved it. It's, it's the most fun in the world and it, you know, move super fast. Computers can like do things that they couldn't do two months ago. And we're constantly in that state. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. If you want to know when the next conversation is released, just hit subscribe wherever you're listening. That's all for now. And I'll catch you next time. <laughs>